back, everybody. You guys had a great weekend. Enjoyed the beautiful spring weather out there. It's the spring that I've been waiting for for years. Um, so today we are we're in the home stretch at this point. You guys have um, your last CBTF quiz starting tomorrow, and the midterm exam, or what we call the midterm, right? The thing that feels like a quiz and it's actually worth a little bit less than a quiz. Uh, just a bit more comprehensive than a quiz starting on Sunday, um, at which point sort of we'll be done with the sort of high stakes assessments in this class. You guys have your final project that you're working on and we have some checkpoints coming up on that. Um, but we, we're not done. We have some time together still and so I wanna use that time to talk about some cool stuff. That's okay with you. Um, today we're gonna continue talking about hashing and, and uh, talk a little bit more about maps or introduce maps, which is another one of these core data structures that will really allow you to more easily solve a wide range of problems. Um, on Wednesday, I'm not going to be here, but I have a video lecture from last semester for you to watch. It's actually quite important. It's a really powerful topic. We'll finish up some stuff on maps, and then we'll talk about a really important job of programming construct called generics that we've seen and we've used when we've declared our lists and when we'll declare our maps, but what we haven't actually programmed with yet. Um, and then that's pretty much it. On Friday, I'll be back. We'll finish up generics. We'll talk a little bit about uh, synchronization and concurrency, because that's sort of fun. And then you guys will be taking your midterm over the weekend. Uh, when we come back next week, on Wednesday, we're going to wrap up, do the ISIS forms. On Monday, we're going to talk about something cool, uh, a little bit of functional programming in Java, which is pretty neat. OK, so remember, from all the way ago on Friday, and I know that the weekend probably wiped your brain a little bit. I know it did mine. Um, but you know, imagine that I told you, so this was the starting point for our conversation about hashing. I told you, you just have to believe me about this, that these functions actually exist. That there's a function with the following properties. So it essentially can, can take an arbitrary amount of data and deterministically convert it into a single small value, okay? That essentially allows me to hash like an entire Java object, and when I get out of hash code, if you look at the uh, function signature, is a long value, okay? So I could take an arbitrary large object um, and I can deterministically convert it into a small value, okay? So if I give it the same object twice, I get the same value out of it, okay? The other thing that's important for our hash function is that if I hash a lot of different things, over time, the probability of getting every output starts to be the same. Or I shouldn't say that. The probability of getting every output is roughly the same when I start. So over time, what you'll see is that every output is equally likely. This is really important um, for a couple of things we're gonna do with hash functions, both what's something we're gonna do today when we start building the map together, and then also a little bit on Wednesday when we talk about some of their cryptographic properties and how they're used in encryption and in Bitcoin, okay? Um, and then finally, for now, and we're, this is an interesting assumption, we're gonna relax this assumption later, but for now, the hash functions that we consider, we want to be efficient. They're easy to compute, so again, I can quickly take a large amount of data, deterministically convert it into a small value, and over the range of that value, I have an equal chance of getting any result, okay? So we refer to something that has this property as a hash function, and we refer to the result using a variety of different terminology, sometimes just as a hash, sometimes as a hash value, sometimes as a hash code or a digest. Um, I will typically call it the hash of a particular value or a particular thing, okay? So, what can we do with such a function? So again, you're just gonna have to um, believe me, trust me, that such functions exist. They do, you can find whole pages of them. This is something that maybe you'll learn a little bit more about at 225 and maybe downstream at 374. But these functions do exist, but given them, what can we do with them? So we started talking about this a little bit right at the very end, but I wanna come back to this because hash functions, one of the reasons we're talking about them this is the point of the semester where it's sort of like dealer's choice. I get to choose what we talk about for the next couple weeks, which is super fun for me. Now, we talked about the internet because it's so important. It's such a foundational part of your lives. We're talking about hashing because it is also so important. It gets used all over the place. And it's actually really, really useful. It's a useful thing to know about when you write computer programs. It's good to know that this can, this can happen, that you can do this, and a few of the things that you can use these values for. All right, so we talked a little bit last time about this, this problem. So you have a big file that you're hosting on some website somewhere, and I want to download it. 
But I know that it's possible, you know, not likely, but possible, that along the way, like, a little bit of the file gets corrupted. Maybe it gets corrupted uh, when it's being transferred over a wireless connection to me. Maybe it gets corrupted somewhere in the bowels of the Internet. I don't know. But it gets to me, and it's not quite right. So I want to be able to download this big thing, but I also want to be confident that the thing that I got is the bytes that I wanted. Because particularly when you're installing software, a small mistake might lead to a pretty big problem. It could damage my computer. All right, so, and so again, before I actually double click on this and install it, I want to make sure that it's the, the file that the sender wanted me to have. It has the exact correct content. And this is big, right? This is a big file. It's got lots and lots of bytes in it, lots and lots of content. So if I don't have a hash function, essentially my options are pretty limited. I can download the file again, and then I can compare the contents. And both of these steps are really slow. You know, imagine this is like a terabyte file or something. I don't know. I mean, gigabytes are not that slow to download anymore, but if this was a big file, this could take a while. So you got to download it again, and then you got to compare the two, and the comparison is also pretty slow. I essentially have to go byte by byte between these two files and make sure that they're identical, right? Uh, but the main problem here is I have to do the download again. That's an expensive operation, right? You imagine, you know, you guys are really used to, um, you know, free data, right? But one of the things to keep in mind, so, um, you know, particularly when you're programming for the next half of the Internet, the other 50% of the world that we're going to bring online over the next 100 years, hopefully within your lifetime, those users don't have unlimited data. So I, I, this is just a brief aside, I noticed I have all these uh, video lectures about operating systems that I posted um, on a, a separate account. And those are still getting viewed by people uh, periodically. And I noticed that one of the, the things that, that the viewers will do, it took me a long time to figure out why they were doing this, is they'll comment and they'll mark the point at which the lecture starts. So on those lectures, usually I, I still play some music beforehand, and I kind of start the video early enough that sometimes I actually don't start talking about useful content until maybe 10 minutes in. So why are people doing that? They're doing it because they don't want to waste the data required to, like, download the song that starts at the beginning of class, right? They want to jump right to the point where there's actual content. Okay, so this is a thing, all right? Okay. So, but remember, I have this function. I'm telling you, trusting me, that this function exists that can do these things. So it can take this large file and can deterministically convert it into a single value, essentially. Okay? Um, the uniformity here is not as important. Determinism is. Um, and it's also pretty efficient to compute. Okay, so what can I do with this hash function? So instead of downloading the file again, I do the following. I download the file once. I take the file contents and I hash it. I hash the file. There are utilities on your computer that will do this for you. I hash my copy, and then what I do is I ask the server. I say, hey, is this the correct hash? Is this the same hash that you got when you hashed the file that you wanted to send me? Okay? So essentially, um, I can download a hash of the file from the server. I can look on the website. You'll see this sometimes. I'm going to show you an example in a minute where people will post the hash of a large file for you to check. Okay? Now, if the hash of the two files is the same, if the hash is what I'm expecting, then I have very high confidence that I got the right file. If the hash is different, I have very high confidence that I got the wrong file. In fact, I'm certain I got the wrong file. If the hash is the same, there's a tiny probability, tiny, tiny, tiny. It depends on the properties of the hash function. We're going to talk about this in a second. But there's a tiny, tiny probability that I still got the wrong file, but it's so small that I don't need to worry about it. Okay? So here's an example of a website that, um, you know, I sometimes download software from. This is a LaTeX distribution for Mac, right? Th there's no reason um, to, to show you this other than the fact that I know it exists. And what you'll see here, okay, so here's the download link. Please don't click on this. Well, like, you'll ruin the Wi-Fi for the rest of the lecture. It's a big file. Um, it's about 3.2 gigabytes. And then right at the top, you see there it says the MD5 sum is, and then there's this massive string of letters and numbers. That's hexadecimal. That is a hash. That's the result of running the file through a hash function called MD5. So you can do this. You can download the file. 
you can run a program called MD5 that'll compute the MD5 hash using the MD5 hash function on that file. And if the hash is D95, blah, 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 then you know you got the right file. So this is a thing that gets used um, in, in the real world. There's actually, I think, now ways for the browser to do this automatically. So sometimes when you see, you know, verifying download or whatever, what, what the browser is doing is it's checking some information about that file, maybe communicating with the server to make sure that the file is correct. So again, MD5 is a popular hash function. This produces a 128-bit hash value. We'll talk about why this is so big in a minute. Um, but, you know, so again, here's, so I'm expecting a hash value of some, some particular um, thing. And this is actual output from my computer. I downloaded the file and I ran this program called MD5. MD5 computed, so the output from MD5 is the name of the file, and then it gives me, it says the hash, the MD5 hash of this file is this. And I can see that these two hash values are the same. So I have the right file, okay? Here's another thing that hash functions get used for, and this is probably even more uh, interesting and relevant, is fingerprinting content. So let's say I have a file and I want to essentially produce a unique ID for that file that is a representative of the contents of the file, except I want that unique ID to be uniform in size. I want everything, every file that I hash in this way, I want to have uh, around the same size. So, and this gets used um, internally by a program you guys have been using all semester, but here's a scenario that shows um, how this might be used. So you send me some sort of Microsoft Word document, uh, which I ignore because it's a Microsoft Word document, but let's just pretend that I actually opened this thing. Um, but, you know, so, and then later, you've made some changes, um, but you can't remember if you sent me the latest version, okay? And so, here's what you can do. Without a hash function, you know, you and I get on the phone together, and it's, okay, what does the file start off with? You know, people do this. This is the sad thing about life. There's still people out there who compare files by, like, loading them up side by side and kind of, like, scrolling carefully through and trying to make sure if they see any changes, right? This is the kind of place where you're like, you are doing the job that a computer can do better. Don't do this sort of thing in the real world. This is something that computers are good at. Without a hash function, you'd either have to send me the latest file again, or we'd have to like go through and manually uh, verify that the two files are the same. But remember, I have this magic function that has these nice properties. It's deterministic, meaning that every time you run it on the same contents, you're gonna get the same result. But that also means, see this uniformity problem, right? This also means that if you change the file, you should get a different hash. If you get the same hash for every file, then it's not a very good hash function because it's not distributing its output over many different inputs. We'll actually come back at the end of class and talk a little bit about a different class of hash functions where we actually want stronger guarantees about what happens when I make changes to the input. And it's also easy to compute. So what do I do? Um, you essentially compute the hash of the file that you have, and I check it against mine, and then if they're the same, then I know that I have this, the identical, you and I have the same file. So that means you sent me the latest version. If they're not the same, it means that I don't have the same version of the file that you have. So you send me your copy. This happens behind the scenes all the time um, you, by Git. Uh, I didn't do a very good job of saying that, but so Git, the uh, version control system you guys have been using all semester, uses hashes to fingerprint files. So how many, have any of you guys ever gone to github.com and seen this thing over here, right? If you browsed your files on GitHub and you've seen this like commit ID, right? This is a hash value. It's a hash. It's the, I think Git uses SHA-128. That's a hash function. It's the hash of the contents of this commit. So internally, Git uses hashes to identify everything. It uses hashes to identify files, it uses hashes to identify commits. Um, and so that's how, when you change something in your repository, that's how Git knows that stuff has changed. Git doesn't compare the files line by line. If you modify binary tree.java, Git computes the hash of the copy in your directory and compares it with the hash from the last commit. If they're different, Git knows that the file has been changed, and so the next time you go to commit, it's gonna prompt you to commit 
the latest version of the file. If they're different, it, if they're the same, it knows that it's the same file. So actually, if you poke around internally inside the directory where Git stores its information, don't do this unless you know what you're doing. And if you do it, certainly don't change anything. What you'll find is that Git stores all sorts of things by hash. There's all sorts of things in there that look like hash values, right? This is definitely a hash value. And the parent commit is also a hash. It's showing you just the first eight um, digits of it. A lot of times with Git um, and other things use a hash function, even just the first eight uh, hexadecimal values from this long hash string are enough to uniquely identify the commit. So, and here's, uh, Git also uses this to communicate with uh, a server like github.com to figure out whether or not the server has a version of the file. So when you push, this is roughly what happens. This is certainly not identically, uh, you know, exactly what happens, but this is roughly what happens when you push. Your computer says, hey, GitHub, I've got, a, I've got this content in the repository. And it sends a bunch of hashes that identify the files that are in your repository. Not just the ones you're working with, but all the ones that you've committed. So it uses the passage to essentially figure out the content you have in your repository. And then GitHub says, okay, well, some of those I already have. Some of them you pushed before. But there's a couple that I still need. So for example, I've already have a copy of this file and a copy of this file, but I need that third file, right? And then your computer will actually transfer the content. So every time you do a git push, if, you're, if you've already pushed the content, there's just still this little dance that's going on where your computer and GitHub are exchanging information about who's got what and using that to determine whether or not there's content that needs to be transferred or not. But this is all done using the file hash. So, so, okay, so now, now let's think about this from Git, Git's perspective. So Git uses the hash value of a file to uniquely identify the contents. If two files hashed to the same value, Git would basically blow up. That would like destroy Git. It would not have any idea what to do. The entire system is predicated on this never happening. But this does happen, it particularly happens with certain type of hash functions. So this is called a collision. If your hash function produces the same value for two inputs, we call this a collision. And again, it really, the, whether or not collisions are a problem depends on what we're doing with the hash function. There are certain systems like Git for which collisions would be a huge problem. And so Git chooses a hash function with a very large output to try to make sure that collisions are very unlikely. There are other cases in which we expect collisions to happen. And when we talk about our map implementation, which we'll get to in 20 minutes, we'll see that part of what we're doing in our implementation is just dealing with collisions, expecting them to happen, and knowing what we need to do about it. So one of my colleagues told me a story about, have you guys heard this story? Apparently somebody was lecturing in Follinger and there was like a squirrel that showed up on stage behind them. And like everybody in the audience saw it before they did and they were just talking and talking. There was like a squirrel back there running around. Um, so now I'm a little paranoid. I like heard something back there. I'm like, I don't know if it's a squirrel or not. If there's a squirrel, please say something about it, right? Um, you guys can you guys can like laugh about it for a couple of minutes, right? But please don't let me. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe it'd be harder for a squirrel to get into Lincoln Hall. Clearly, it was, it was possible to get a squirrel to fold. All right. So, um, so in some cases, we expect collisions to happen, right? Um, but if the size of the hash is large enough and the hash function is actually really uniform then we don't expect collisions to happen. So again, Git will just melt down if there's a collision. It has no ability to deal with this. It expects that if two files hash to different values, those files are different. Okay. But how, so let's talk about collisions and how much of a problem they're going to be, right? And this brings us to this uh, famous piece of mathematics, which is kind of fun, right? So this is, how many people have heard of the birthday paradox before? Okay, good, a couple of you. Um, Right, maybe you guys remember this. So, uh, 100 students, room with 100 students, what is the probability that two of them have the same birthday? That there exist two students with the same birthday? Don't cheat, I know it's on the slide. Anybody know? Like, what, what's, a, what's, a, what's a naive guess? Like, what might you think? Tell me, tell me the, 
incorrect but sort of reasonable guess here, right? So there's 365 days in the year, I've got 100 students, so I might think like, oh, it's about a third, right? Turns out it's 99.999999. It is almost one, okay? Does that surprise you? It's interesting. How many do you need to get a 50% chance? Well, actually, this is fun. It's sort of things you should know for interviews. How many people do you have to have in a room before there's a 50% chance that two of them, you're having a dinner party, people are coming over, and you're wondering, how many people do I have to invite to the dinner party before I have a 50% chance that two of them will have the same birthday? Yeah? 23. That's it. Pretty impressive, right? This is, you know, again, this is much smaller than you would have thought. And you can sort of, if you think this through, right, I'd be happy to discuss this with you on the forum, you can convince yourself of why this is, okay? Um, it's because, note how the problem is set up. It's not that they have a specific same birthday. It's that any two of them happen to have any same birthday, right? So that makes the, the probability go up considerably. Now, what does this have to do with hash functions? Well, you can think of people's birthdays as like a hash function for a person, right? So imagine I want to design a hash function for a person. I can say, okay, well, my hash function is take, uh, ask the person what their birthday is, and then convert that to a number, right? Like a day of the year, zero through 355. So that's, you know, uh, now people aren't born uniformly throughout the year, I don't think. Someone can go find data about this for me. So this isn't like a perfect hash function, but it's not bad, right? You know, I would assume that this would be a reasonable way to do things. Um, but, so this is bad news for our hash functions because it turns out that collisions are gonna happen more often than we would like. So if I use your birthday, again, as a day of the year between zero and 355, as a hash function, I can only hash 23 people before I have a 50% a, a chance that there's a collision. And the probability goes up quite a bit, right? So if I'm using this as a hash function, despite the fact, even if it's uniform, it turns out that I don't need to hash very many things before I get a collision. So this is an unfortunate problem, uh, pro you know, uh, this has unfortunate consequences for our hash functions. So again, let's treat this from Git's perspective. So again, Git is going to melt down and die if two files hash to the same um, hash value. And I also suspect like github.com is probably going to have problems if any two files anywhere that are different hash to the same value. Look, if I have two identical files, they have the same hash value. That's an important property of a hash function. But GitHub, I don't know how many files are on GitHub. Some can, can probably look this up, but I suspect it's billion. If any of them that are different actually happen to have the same hash value, I suspect something on GitHub is going to break. All right? Um, so how many documents do I have to hash before I find uh, two with the same hash value with a 50% probability or more, right? So this depends on how large the hash is. As I make the hash bigger and bigger and bigger, the probability that I get collisions goes down because the hash space gets larger. And so if I have a 16-bit hash function, so the output is a number that is 16 bits, so it's between zero and like 65,000, I only need 300 files. I have a 50% probability of a collision. This is, this is an outdated slide, but I think that number was like from, you know, some of the starter code that we guys give you for uh, our MPs has already like 100 files in it, right? So 300 files is not very many. If I increase the size of the hash function to 32 bits, now I can hash 77,000 files before I have a 50% probability of a collision. That's still not very many. My computer has like two and a half million files on it. And I want you to know most of those files came with the computer. I have not created 2.4 billion files, a uh, million files, sorry. A lot of those just are there, right? They come as part of your operating system, as part of the, the uh, applications and programs that run on your computer when you get it out of the box. All right, so let's go bigger. 64 bits, okay, so now I'm getting somewhere. All right, so now I, I can actually hash five billion files before I find two with the same, uh, before I find a collision with 50% probability. Um, GitHub.com has one billion files. I guess we know how many files are on GitHub.com. Um, so that's okay. 
But I, I don't feel like this has a lot of headroom. I'm still not very comfortable with this value. Um, if I get to 128 bits, so that's the size of the hash function used by get, now I can hash a large number of files before I find a collision. Right, so this is, again, this is the size of the hash function that git uses. Um, at some point, maybe like millions of years from now, if the Earth is still around, um, maybe Git will decide to go to 160-bit hash function. Those exist, or 256 bits. Uh, but for now, this uh, this size is appropriate. Right? I certainly, because again, remember, Git essentially wants the probability of a collision to be zero, and so it makes sense to use a large enough hash function so that the probability is extremely, extremely. Okay, yeah. Oh wait, sorry, git uses 160 bits, so we're, we're good, right? So git, for git we get all of this plus like another 32 bits, right? So I don't even know, I, 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 think I, I think I tried to calculate what this probability was and like the tool I was using kept crashing because it couldn't represent a number that big. So, so we're good, we're safe for now. Trust me, if there are two files somewhere in a git repository or on github.com that happen to hash, to the same value, you will read about it. It will be news, at least within the technology uh, community. I have, I, but I can do larger hash values, right? So I have hash functions that have 512 bits, right? Um, so for a 512-bit hash function, I can hash 1.4 times 10 to the 77th files before I have a collision. Now again, that's like only about a tenth of the number of atoms in the universe. So that's probably enough. But again, you know, you imagine the early internet guys sitting around and saying, well, it's probably enough to have 32-bit addresses. Not so much, right? So, so we've, we've discovered in the world of technology things get big fast. Okay, any questions about this before we go on? I've shown you some use cases for hash functions. We've talked about a few problems. Now I wanna show you an application. All right, so this is where things get neat. Again, hash functions themselves are very cool. Um, but the data structure that we can use them to help build is one of the most important that, that you're gonna find. Okay, so you remember like light years ago, we talked about arrays. Arrays were a data structure that allowed us to put things in order. But you can also think of an array as essentially mapping an integer index to a value. So when I put a number into an array, I'm essentially associating a integer key with that number. So essentially when I say numbers one is equal to eight, I'm, I'm mapping the integer one to the integer eight. Now again, I know that arrays also force you to have contiguous, like continuous values and stuff like that, but on some level, you can think of an array as mapping, converting an index between zero and array dot length to a value, all right? So we've seen and we've used arrays of all sorts of different types of Java objects. So the value up till this point could be anything. But the indices had to be integers and they had to be consecutive. And in certain places, that turns out to be kind of a pain. This is a limitation. It, it, it gets in the way of me trying to solve the problem. So today, we can finally lift that limitation. And we can build a general purpose data structure that can map anything to anything else. So in Java, this is something called a map, right? So this is the second data structure that you meet in heaven. First one is lists, an array that I can change the size of. The second one is a map. Now, in Java, some of the syntax here gets a little ugly, but don't let this get in the way of your appreciation of this particular construct. This is incredibly powerful, okay? A map in Java, allows us to map a key to a value. When I declare a map, as I'm doing on line four, I need to tell Java what type of key I'm gonna use in the map and what type of value I'm gonna use in the map. So this is a map that maps from strings to integers. Then on the right side, this should look familiar to you from our uh, work with lists. So remember, map with a list, we had list which was an interface, and then we had different implementations of list, like linked list, array list. Map is the same way. Map is an interface in Java. Hash map is one implementation of a map. 
It's called a hash map because internally it uses a hash function. We're gonna see how in a minute. Once I have a map, what I can do is I can add mappings to it. So to add a mapping, I use the syntax put. Put takes a key and a value. So now what I'm doing is I'm associating the value five with the key test. Then I can also get, right? So this is sort of like storing a value in my array. This is sort of like getting a value out of my array. I can get, and then when I, when I call get, I pass it the key. Um, I can change the values that I've already added. So here I'm putting, I'm reassociating a different value with the same key, and now I'm gonna be able to get this out. So again, very much, the, the, the interface looks a lot kind of like a list, except I'm throwing off this limitation that I had to have integers as list indices no longer. Now I can map anything to anything else. So again, maps are so useful. And, you know, I, I hate to say this, because we teach this class in Java, but Java syntax for maps is some of the worst out there, okay? Um, when you graduate from this class and go on in your future as a programmer, you're gonna find maps in pretty much every language that you use. In fact, I would argue if you find a language that doesn't have one, um, run away. Uh, don't, don't use it for anything, okay? Um, Python has them, and in Python, look at this. So this is very cool. Python makes them look like an array, right? So this is Python's syntax for using something called a dictionary. It looks a lot like an array. I'm using bracket notation, but inside the brackets, I'm using a string. I can't do this in Java. Java arrays, indices have to be integers. In Python, I can create something called a dictionary, and then I can set and get values from it using bracket notation. Um, so the thing inside the brackets can be a string rather than just an int, okay? JavaScript calls them anonymous objects. The syntax is very similar. Um, C++ calls them maps and has disgusting syntax for it because in C++. Um, Go calls them maps and has very nice syntax. Uh, it's a little bit of more of a modern language, so this looks a lot like Python. Even Perl. Has anyone heard of Perl? Okay, that's good. Perl is a language that we're allowing to die. Um, and it's good because it's, it was, Perl was, anyway, I, I, I don't have time for a digression, but. Um, Perl had its day. Um, so this, this was, uh, Perl's an old language, there's still people using it, but one of the things that was fun about Perl was that it actually did have this. It called them, uh, it called them dictionaries, I think, right? So here's Perl's syntax for, for the same thing. Um, so the, the terminology we use differs. Sometimes they are called maps, sometimes they're called dictionaries, uh, sometimes they're just called anonymous objects. Um, but in all cases, essentially, um, I can associate an arbitrary value with an arbitrary key, where the key and the value can be any type of data that I can represent in the language, not just an int, not just a string, anything. All right, so as I promised, um, Java maps are an interface, and you can read more about them on the, on the Java doc. There are a couple of different ways to um, implement them. Let's look up here, right? So all known implementing classes, so you'll see hash map, uh, there's also a linked hash map. There is a tree map. There's something called a weak hash map. Uh, so there's, like, like lists, we have one interface that describes how this particular type of data structure works, and then we can implement that under the hood in a variety of different ways. All right. So let's mess around with uh, maps a little bit. So I've got my map example here, and again, I can um, put things into it. Um, and then get them out. Oops. I need to do app sample get test. Right, so that's gonna work. Uh, if I try to get something that doesn't have, um, that isn't in the map, I get null. Um, I can add multiple things to my map. So I can do, Right, so now I've got two keys in the map. I can get them both out. The map interface has some other um, useful uh, features for me. So for example, I can test whether a particular key works. Nope, that's not the right name for the function. Right, so this key is in the map. This key is not in the map. Okay, so you guys are gonna have some chance of practices on the homework problems, but again, this is like su super useful. Okay, so. So useful, what do we use it for? Okay, so let's do a classic map example. All right, 
So let's say I want to take a bunch of text, like, you know, the Constitution of the United States, or the Congressional Report, or news articles, or all the Reddit content that's been posted this semester, or something, right? And I essentially want to build a count of how many times different words appear. Now this sounds like kind of a silly thing to do, but it turns out that this is actually the first step in doing a lot of machine learning on text, right? Is to compute uh, what's called a bag of words, right? So a lot of machine learning models don't actually use the structure of the text at all. They just count how many times different words appear and build various types of predictive models on that. So it's, it's actually surprising how well that works. All right, so but essentially I want to take this text and I want to convert it into um, a map where essentially I can query now how many times a particular word appears. Okay. Now we're gonna do this using a map, but I kind of want you to think about how awful this would be to do given the types of data structures you guys already know how to use. Like for example, I could use a list and put everything into a list and then I guess I could count it. Um, arrays here are very little help. Um, you know, this is, a, this is actually a messy problem to solve using any other data structure. Um, it is a elegant problem to solve using a map. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Um, so I've got a little um, new class here. I'm gonna use a hash map. Uh, when I create my word counter, I create it, it's initially empty. Um, and I'm also, when I create the word counter, I'm also passing it the text as an array of strings. I could split up the strings myself, but here I'll just pass an array, that's not a problem. Um, so essentially in my constructor, I've gotta do the work to set up my map, okay? So, I'm gonna go through all of the words. So this is good practice using old constructs in text, all right? And so the, um, there's, a, there's a nice function here, um, that, you, that is helpful in certain situations like this, that's called, where is it, get or default. So essentially, get or default allows me to say, get me the value that's in the map, or return this other value if that key isn't in the map yet. So I'm gonna use this to retrieve the count for my items as I go through the map, okay? So I've already, uh, Alec, I've already, uh, declared my map up here, matching, mapping strings to integers. So it's essentially gonna allow me to look up, based on a string, how many times it appears in this corpus of text. So the first thing I'm gonna do for each one is I'm gonna say um, word count got get or default for this particular word, and the, the default value I'm gonna use is zero. If I've never seen the word before, it's been in the document zero times, right? So this gets me the number of times that the, the, the word was in the document before, right? So before, I, so I just saw it, but I need to know how many times I saw it before so that I can increase the count. And then I'm gonna do word count dot set word count plus plus. All right, so first thing I do is I get a count of how many times it's appeared previously. So I either get the value out of the map if this word has appeared in the text before, or I get this zero value. Um, and then, now oh, it's mad at me about something. Oh, it's put, yeah. there we go, okay. So now I've gotta fix my get word count function to actually do the right thing here. So my get word count function is also gonna use this nice um, helper function called get or default. It's gonna pa I'm gonna pass in word, and if the word's not in the document, I'm gonna return zero. All right, so let's see if I, let's see if this, um, let's see if this works. So this doesn't seem to work yet. Um, I'm using put properly here. There we go, okay. Count plus plus doesn't do the trick, so I count plus one. All right, so let's, let's try to make sure this is right, first of all, before we, a step through exactly what it's doing and how it works. So I, my corpus here is the string, the, the strings here, here, there. So here appears twice, there appears once. I create my word counter with that corpus which generates the map and now I'm prepared to answer queries about how many, time, how many times each word appears in the map. So the first question I ask is how many times does here appear? That's twice. How many times does there appear? That's once. And then I can ask for keys 
things that aren't in the map. Uh, let's try this and make sure it works. If I add some, some new inputs here, let's check about blah, that looks right. So again, like this would be, you can try, you know, give this a try if, if, if you're looking for something fun to do this afternoon and see if you can implement this without a map. The answer is probably yes, but it's going to be a mess. This is a very, very nice way to do this. But it's all made possible by the fact that now I have this generalization of an array, right? Um, that allows me to store a value per string in, in the image. Questions about this before we go on? You guys are gonna have a couple homework problems this week where you get a chance to work with maps. And also with trees and stuff like that. So this is kind of a fun, this is a, a fun new feature of Java. All right, so very briefly, we have 10 minutes. Let's talk a little bit about how we would implement such a thing. So this is clearly cool and useful, but how would I implement this, and what does it have to do with hash function? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. When you put a value into the hash map, into the map, sorry, here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna call hash code. Hash code is gonna give me a hash value for each object. Remember, this is built into Java. I don't have to do any work here. I don't have to implement my own hash function. I'm just gonna use the one that's already built into Java. I'm gonna use hash code. Then, I'm gonna use that value, or actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shrink it down using the, the remainder operator. I'm gonna use it as an index into an array. Okay, so internally, my map implementation stores an array of objects, okay? So essentially, this is how I'm gonna get the array index to use. I'm gonna take hash code, and then I'm gonna use the modulus operator to shrink it down, so I get a uniform value between like zero and eight, or zero and 16, or something like that. What do I do if I have a collision? No. So now, you know, again, I'm using a, I'm not using a very big array, necessarily, so there's a probability that two objects I try to put into the map are actually gonna hash to the same value. So in order to deal with collisions, I have a couple of different approaches. This is the one that's implemented on the next slide. So this is, this combines, and again, this is fun. I love this point of the semester, because you guys have seen all this stuff and you get it, so now we can talk about cool things. This is a combination of two data structures we've seen already this semester. On the left, you have an array. And what is hanging off of every uh, slot in the array? That looks like something else we've seen. So this is pretty obviously an array, right? What's, what's, what are these things? Yeah. What's that? Is it a tree? Yeah. Do I see any cases where I have multiple children? Close. The other, yeah. It's a linked list, exactly. So what I have here is on the left I have a, an array, and every slot in the array points to the start of a linked list, or refers to the start of a linked list. And this is how I deal with collisions. If two items end up in the same slot in the array, I just add the new item to the end of a list. And then if I need to retrieve it, I find the right spot in the array, and I walk the list until I find the element. All right, so here's the, the starter code for this. I'm pretty sure that we have a homework problem this week where you guys get to finish this. And again, this is fantastic practice for the midterm that you guys are gonna take this weekend because it brings together a couple of uh, different things that we've already seen this semester. So again, up here, I have a little half private hash function that I'm using. What does that do? It calls hash code, and it essentially computes the modulus using this table size constant that's defined as part of the class. This little bit of grossness here is because Java doesn't actually have a modulus operator. Um, but internally, what my class is storing is an array of items. And what you'll see here is that in my put function, what I do is I figure out what bucket, what slot in my array. When we use hash tables, we usually call them buckets. Um, what slot in the array this belongs to. And then this is code that we've used in the past to walk a list, because every spot in the array is the start of a list. And then I've got two cases. Either I find, either my put is replacing an existing key. So either I find an object in the map that already has that key, at which point I just modify the value, or if I get down here, it means that this key doesn't exist in the map. And so if it doesn't exist, I create a new item for it and I stick it at the end. 
I will let you guys review this code on your own, and you will need to, again, because we're gonna have you guys implement Git. All right, but let's, let's bring something else together right now, and let's bring in our big O analysis. So again, this is one of the reasons that this is so much fun. We get to do a little data structures, we get to do a little new stuff, we get to do a little old stuff. Order event, uh, a log, order big O analysis on this particular data structure, okay? So we're gonna consider two cases. Let's say, let's imagine the array in my map of notation is very small. So let's say I have an array of size four. That means essentially when I compute the hash, I'm putting the item into one of four buckets. So at that point, put and get start to be O-N. Why are they O-N? Because I've gotta walk this entire list because there's a long list hanging out of every one of my hash buckets. So let me go back and show you this, um, this again. So if I, if the, if the number of these gets very small, so imagine taking this and shrinking it down, but I still have to store the same items. Now I've got lists hanging off of every bucket and those lists are getting longer and longer. You can imagine I can have a hash table with only one uh, bucket in it. It's just a linked list. So at this point, when the array gets small, my hash table starts to act very much like a linked list and has O-N performance both for put and for get. Okay, but now let's consider the other case. Let's consider the case where the array gets really, 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 really big. At that point, the lists that the array has references to are getting very, very small. Many slots in the array don't have a list at all, and the ones that do usually only have a list with one item. So now, put and get are starting to become constant time. Essentially, if I make my array big enough, what this starts to act like is an array. I get constant time put and get if I make the array big enough. Now this seems like the winner between the small array and the big array. If I make the array really big, I get constant time lookups and, and modifications. Why don't I do this? What's the trade-off here? It's always a trade-off. Why am I, why do I have this combination of things in the first place? Yeah. It takes up a lot of space. So if I, as I make the array bigger, the array itself is taking up a lot of space, and most of it's empty, right? Because, you know, that's what I want. Most of the buckets are empty. They don't have any values in them. All right, so. In reality, what we typically do is we use the hash map to blend, we, we size the array to blend things together, right? To give us a trade-off between not using too much memory and not having ON performance, right? Normally what, like if you use Java's hash map implementation, which I would encourage you to do, it does this internally. So when you start adding things to it, initially it uses a small array, but at some point, if the map starts to get really big, it will rebalance it. It'll increase the size of the array and move stuff around. All right, so, so anyway, so I, I, I love this data structure mainly because there are so many cool trade-offs to think about here, right? This is one of these places where, again, you know, I can get, end up with very bad performance, I can end up with very good performance, um, and I have this explicit trade-off in terms of how much space I'm using. All right, cool. I am gonna stop here um, I will, I'm gonna look online and figure out how this links up with Wednesday. I have a couple of announcements to make that are important. Um, so let me do this one first, because this is something, probably something you're gonna care about. So our third and final midterm starts on Sunday. Sunday and Monday in the CBTF, okay? This is off schedule, so please don't miss it. Um, it cannot be dropped. Um, the focus is on data structures and algorithms, but really this brings together everything we've done this semester. So you should expect to see everything and anything on this midterm. There are three programming problems worth half of the grade. All of them have partial credit. This is similar to previous midterms, um, and the rest are multiple choice questions. So again, we're gonna ask you to solve some fairly sophisticated problems on this midterm. As always, the best way to do this is to review the homework problems. Here's what's on the midterm, okay? Here are the questions that are on the midterm. I do not want you guys to be unprepared for this. There is a question on trees. There is a question on lists. 
I'm not gonna tell you what those questions are, but they're quite similar to homework problems that you've already done. So if you wanna prepare, do the homework problem. There is a sorting question that has already been on the homework. So that one, go through the sorting questions and make sure you know how to do them, all right? Questions about the midterm. All right, an important announcement. We will not have class on Wednesday. I have a video lecture from last semester I'm gonna assign for you guys to watch. It is important to watch this. There are multiple choice questions about this content on the exam. Um, my, I also won't have office hours on Wednesday. You guys have an MP5 checkpoint in lab, good luck. I will see you on Friday.